Hello, this is Jim Freund. This is our first like, truly video version of Hour of the Wolf with me, one of my favorite writers who I got to meet uh, curiously years ago, uh, Karen Russell. I met Karen because I was doing some tech support for her agent, Denise Shannon. <laughs> so I believe it's still your agent, right? She is still my agent. Yeah, she's she's wonderful. I miss her. She's in New York with you. Um, uh, just, you know, keeping on, just stay, trying to stay afloat right now. Yeah. So uh, while I have done uh, Facebook Lives with guests, in other words, we'll have somebody in the studio and I'll just set up my little camera and show people this is different. This is actually a two-person format and... It's fun. It, it's it, pretty it, cool. It's a really short commute, you know. I just yeah. kind of, you know, wandered in from the living room. It's so fun to see you, Jim, because I have such a vivid memory. You know, it's not often that you get to do an interview in the dead of the night. And I just so this was when I was, um, in my mind now, baby. You know, I was like in my early twenties in New York, and Jim came and picked me up um, in like, you know, I, I mean, it must have been around four a.m. Right. Yes. Um, it was the 4th of July. So I just remember going to sleep and watching like all of these like fireworks, like, you know, glittering on the horizon. And then it felt like seconds later, I was in a car with Jim leaving um, Washington Heights for the studio. And I remember, Jim, that you ate an ice cream sandwich when we got there, which oh, really? I thought was like the most charming thing. Oh, that was yeah. Cool. Was diagnosed with diabetes. Well, you offered me one too, which I also I was like, this is like the this is the hour of the wolf because I've never experienced it, and it was so nice. I'm usually up alone at that time, um, often with an ice cream sandwich, so it was nice to have a companion. Yeah, you're one of the few people who actually knows what hour of the wolf is. Yeah, well, you know, um, when I was working on this book, the Italians had this beautiful word that I'm not going to try to pronounce, but it's basically for out for the hour of the wolf. It's you know, it's for that. And it's, it describes a psychic landscape as much as a literal one, you know, and just that period between sleepfulness and waking, you know. Yep. Um, uh, Varg Timon in the Swedish. Oh, and, beautiful. We need that, one in English. Uh, yeah, we do. We really do. Well, the closest we have really is morning twilight, but it's not mm -hmm. just about the hour. It's about, as you say, the state of mind. Yeah, I mean, thinking thoughts just have a different quality at that time. Um, but when Margot yeah. Adler started, she created the show. Um, and she named it after the movie, the Ingmar Bergman film. Yes, which is amazing, that movie. Which is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, his movie just before that, I think, was Persona. So this is in his possibly weirdest, most depressing period. <laughs> which, you yeah, know. It's like later Goya. Yeah. <laughs> it's too... yeah it really is. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, so the radio show is named after that. We went through a cycle because we named the radio show after that movie. And then, uh, Last year, Naomi Watts put out a movie called The Wolf Hour. Oh, wow. And it was about, about a that. woman who was in a very strange psychological place, but at 5 a.m. would turn on her radio. It took place in 1977 during the summer of Sam, when there were all these murders in New York. Right. And she would listen to a particular radio show at that time. And apparently, uh, when the <laughs> film showed at Sundance, they made it very clear that the radio show was Hour of the Wolf. But since it came out uh, early this year, pre-pandemic, it got, didn't get very good reviews, unfortunately. But uh, they changed the name. Oh, man. Not, not the name of the movie. The movie's still called The Wolf Hour. But they changed oh. the name of the radio show or my voice being in it or anything like that. But so what's the new name? I'm, I love the hour of the wolf. I mean, it, what could what could improve upon that? 
Well, the movie is still the wolf hour. Yeah. And the, the, uh, um, I haven't seen the film, but uh, I, th I think that uh, actually they may even say, I, I think now the name of the radio show in the movie is the wolf hour. The wolf hour. Yeah. Close enough. Close enough. And also, I mean, I do that, you know, I, I wrote a story uh, a couple of years ago after um, giving birth to my son that was a real hour of the wolf story. It was called Orange World. And it was just about oh. a woman who, you know, wakes up to breastfeed the devil. She makes a, a, a really bad deal with like a minor demon and just has to wake up, you know, every night um, a little after four to go meet this demon in the gutter and nurse him. And I have to say, you know, I heard from many, <laughs> many moms who were like, oh yeah, the hour of the wolf, I've been there sister. You know, um, it is just a really, it's a flexible time. It feels like, um, you know, don't, don't look in mirrors at that hour is my, my basic policy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of so, get back to sleep as quickly as you can. Yeah. But uh, we'll be, well, the initial broadcast of this will be at that hour, but that's just radio yeah. broadcast. Since we yeah. are filming this, we'll, we'll put it up on YouTube. And, yeah, this is the new the new era. Yeah, it is. It is, and uh, I'm trying to transition there. Unfortunately, putting it on YouTube means no phone calls, no uh, music, but right. people can chat, and you and I can log in there. And there was something really kind of old school and magical about a phone call coming in at you know like five a.m. <laughs> I mean, I thought that was incredible to me. Yeah, just the weird intimacy of voices meeting at that hour. You know, I mean, this is also amazing. Uh, but sometimes I'm like, wow, it took so much technology to achieve what a landline phone call is also able to do, you know. Yeah. And, and, and um, yeah, you never know who's listening in, Jim. <laughs> and, uh, and since the show now streams as well as broadcasts, I have a listener who regularly calls in from Bulgaria. Oh, wow. Well, that is amazing. That does feel like, um, yeah, the, the sci-fi weaving of the minds. You just in defiance of time zones and oceans. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but, you know, we'll carry that another step. And I met somebody virtually this weekend. I was a guest. Um, at a science fiction convention. And one of the texts there said, oh, there are ways you can do phone calls. Now, it's got to be complicated because yeah. for all the podcasts in the world and all the YouTube vlogs and things out there, <laughs> you never seen it happen. But this guy sounded like the real deal. Could, could make it happen. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So our son, you know, he's three and a half and he now has seen us. We have Alexa and all this, these other kind of gadgets in our house. So it's just unclear to him what's going to respond. You know, you're in the car and he'll be like, hey, Google, the sun is in my eyes. Like, I think this generation is going to really have to grapple with. Yeah. <laughs> about nine There's a lot of spookiness, you know, to sort of some appliances responding to you and some are just sort of mute. <laughs> no. Um... We have uh, uh, Google Assistant devices. You have to say right. the D word quietly, or they start speaking. And <laughs> yeah. Without giving it the keyword, we were watching something on TV, and all of a sudden, the speaker starts giving us unasked for information that wasn't even that relevant at that right. time. Right. Right. It lives in a world of its own. It's a haunted world now, you know? I mean, it was before also, but I, I do find that that's a really particular, you know, 21st century spookiness where my son will be like, uh, play my song, <laughs> you know, to the lamp. You know, you just don't know what's going <laughs> to. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's true. I mean, they have mirrors. They have vanity mirrors. They oh, really wow. that, that have this stuff built in. And, um, it yeah, it's becoming ubiquitous. So all of a mm -hmm. sudden, these things start talking to you. Sometimes they're very useful. 
Yeah. I'm, I'm very dependent on, on certain AI and, and also, you know, uh, I, I had a conversation about a year ago when we could still, you know, have conversations in restaurants and shadow casting reality with Ted Chang, um, who I'm just a huge fan of, uh, like most of the world, it seems, you know, um, but we were talking about a little bit this predictive AI and I told him about sleep donation and he reassured me he doesn't think that that <laughs> he doesn't think anyone will be, you know, um, projecting our actual dreams onto screens in our lifetimes anyway. So I found that reassuring because right. who would want to make that phantasmagoria public? Not myself. So now that you mentioned uh, you opened the box, uh, sleep donation, tell us about it. Oh, okay. Uh, so published this a while ago, right? Yeah, that's what my dad said. He was like, isn't this kind of a reheat? He felt the same way about my story collection. He was like, but you already published all of these. It's a just just oh, a damn you. reheat. I was like, well, I was like, some things taste better left over, as we all know. Um, it is a little bit. I mean, it's I was so happy. I can I can show you guys. I think they did such a beautiful job. This it was published in 2014 as an ebook with this oh, sort can, of to me very exciting I company atavist books. Yeah, that, there you go. Like this is much more uh, tech savvy. Um, and I was you know Francis Cody had started was helming this like really exciting digital publishing initiative, and they um, I think the idea was they were going to kind of mix up the landscape for ebooks and do some really wild experimental kind of corner of the eye projects and for authors and i so i was i had this this strange story that had kind of developed a life of its own and it was it was not i didn't think of it as a novel it was way too long to really be published in a magazine and so i was pretty excited um and really loved working with that team and then unfortunately seven months in um, they lost their financing and they went under. And so then this book was in like a strange purgatorial space for a long time. In 2018, Vintage, I sold a story collection to them. And also um, uh, we talked about bringing sleep donation back in like a print edition. And um, yeah, that's what, so we, so this was way before our actual pandemic. And I didn't, didn't know at the time, none of us did that I would be like launching this book about a nightmare epidemic into our nightmarish year. Um, and I wish very much that was, <laughs> that wasn't the framing, but you know, it has sort of changed my own relationship to the story a little bit. And so around this time last year, I was working with these amazing artists, Ali and Ali, these Italian studio artists on a nightmare contagion map. I just thought it'd be fun since we were going to do a print edition. I really wanted it. I wanted it to, to, to feel new. So we came up with this sort of like, uh, pamphlet, you know, kind of an appendix and they're, you know, with illustrated nightmares. Um, it's like this whole map with sleep quarantine stations, you know, the jellyfish dream that's sort of circulating in the mid-Atlantic states and things like this, which seemed really funny to me a year ago and seems, you know, less funny now, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, well, so I'm, not, I'm honestly not sure how readers will. I think that I had this idea that it was going to be sort of a whimsical riff on these like really dire medical brochures. But now I find myself reading, reading the CDC, you know, for information daily. So it's it's just a very different context than the one that this was kind of conceived of in. Um, you know, it feels it just feels sort of like documentary now, whereas before it felt like this wild flight. You know. Um. Well, I, th I think actually at this point um, uh, is a good time for you to read since we've okay. been discussing it. How long okay. will your reading be about? Oh, maybe five minutes. Is that too long? I think something That's really short. Too long, God. Okay. All I right. Mean, it's Samuel R. Delaney for two and a half, you know, doing something for two and a half hours, you know, so. <laughs> you know, I, 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 and I, right. Well, he's somebody who, who really can hold the floor for two and a half hours, you know, I think uh, this will be more like a, you know, I don't know what, like a, like a piece of chewing gum, something to give you the flavor of the thing. And then we'll, <laughs> and then we'll proceed. Good, good I think my favorite part now are, are these pictures. And I, I, I sort of think that's my new ambition. It turns out is just to give words to artists. I, it's just so usually when you talk about a book, you're always sort of trafficking in this medium, which is also, you know, fabulous. How amazing that, we can find each other in time and space and have a conversation. But 
I can't even draw like a dog. You know, my three-year-old just hit a developmental milestone where he knows I'm a terrible artist. <laughs> and he's like, what is that, mom? Um, so to see what these amazing collage artists came back with was was so exciting. Yeah, actually, this is my favorite. This is this little baby. Um, so the story is about a nightmare epidemic. Um, well, it starts out, everybody, millions of people in America have lost the ability to sleep. Nobody's exactly sure why. This has been going on for seven years. And there's a nonprofit, the Slumber Corps, that is taking donations of sleep and dreams from healthy donors. Babies are especially valuable donors. Um, and they're using these to keep insomniacs alive. So that's the setup. Uh, yeah. I'll read a little bit, just a little bit about that. Uh, cool. So, so and, I'm going to hide myself and we'll put it into reading mode. All right. Okay, so let's see. All right. I think I'm going to read. Um, so this, this is told from the point of view of a recruiter and her sister died. Uh, she was one of the earliest victims of this insomnia, uh, terminal insomnia that's afflicting a lot of people in the country. And now she spends all of her time and energy telling the story of her sister's death again and again um, in, a, in a slightly manipulative way to try to get people to donate their sleep and dreams to this organization. Um, uh, she, they found this baby, baby A, whose dreams are like compatible with everybody. She, you know, no nightmares, no disturbances. She's like their ideal donor. Um, and, and this recruiter woman is trying to convince the parents that it's absolutely safe for the baby to continue to donate, even though she has her own doubts about this. So um, hundreds of lives have been saved since baby A's donations, thanks to baby A's donations. Many thousands more who are waitlisted for a transfusion have been given an EEG recording of baby A's brainwaves transformed into an audio recording as part of an experimental study. There's some evidence that even remote contact with this baby's dreams might reset insomniac's body clocks. All of this is well documented by our outreach videos. But baby A's life would have been far better off, I'm certain, if I'd never found her. The Harkonnens live in a transitional neighborhood, houses that you might call fixer-uppers or derelict, depending on how cheerful you're feeling. Even light seems hesitant to enter them. Last year, many of the rotting facades got repainted in gumball shades of pink and lime, some misguided civics project to brighten this part of our city. It's a pretty superficial shellacking. The cars and motorcycles outside are still junkers. Lawns are covered with many octaves of weeds shading from crud brown to yellowy beige. And even the leafy trees seem to me to have too many limbs mutating away from the rooftops in a silent, wild freedom. Several bikes knock around on their chains, an eerie, genial sound, as if the machines are gossiping. Early spring and this whole block smells like flowers. The heaving blossoms turn out to be everywhere once you notice them, overflowing the rain gutters and the sills of second story windows, unencouraged, unsupported, and nevertheless, here once more, vivid white in the night air. Beauty stages its coup in every suburb and slum in the galaxy. You're lucky to be alive to see it, aren't you, Edgewater? I have several canned lectures designed to reduce my nausea after talking about my sister, which I mentally self-administer in Rudy's stern voice. Tonight I'm snuffed. My sister's story, now in its told state, expulsed, floats somewhere far outside me emitting jellyfish light. Sometimes my sister's absence takes me over and I'm a sleepwalker. Now, for example, as I double back to the Harkonnens, here they come again, the white flowers, bystanders rooted in the bright light flowing from the sleep van. Bodies move with their own sly life behind the windows, bending and straightening. For no easily discernible reason, I am terrified to re-enter the van. At some sore point on my revolution around the block, I seem to have removed my name badge, my core recruiter jacket. I'd much prefer to remain a stranger out here underneath these fragrant narcotics, the ruffling white blossoms. I can hear the baby crying. 
Up ahead, I see the Harkonnen's two-toned Chevy again, brown and turquoise, the basketball hoop with its frayed net. Underneath it, the sleep van is parked with its rear doors wide open, spilling yellow light across the lawn. Framed in the window, I can see baby A strapped to the catch crib, her feet tensing and relaxing like little fists. No, no, see the bag inflating? She's still breathing on her own. Get a seal on that, Carmen. Get a tighter seal on that. After drawing from Baby A, we drive to the other side of town to get a draw from Roberta Frias. Roberta is six and such a funny kid, chatty until the very second before the anesthetic crests and rolls her under. She's no Baby A, but her sleep is very useful to us, transfusable into a high percentage of insomniacs. EEGs of her first draw dazzle the nurses. Beautiful NREM, slow wave, delta sleep. The state in which a body repairs tissue, builds bone, strengthens its immune system. On the catch cot under the clear mask, her smile flutters and disappears. Her mother always dresses Roberta up for a donation, and the nurses have given up on telling her that this is unnecessary. Tonight, she's wearing a frilly yellow dress covered in tiny gray mice and a pink hairband. Her parents are watching from the corner of the sleep van, nervous and proud. Mr. Frias, a chubby Puerto Rican pastor, taxi driver, and devoted father, a lip biter, gives me the thumbs up when our eyes meet. I don't know how to describe the unique claustrophobia of a sleep draw if you've never been present for one, except to compare it to the electric, heavy feeling of air carrying seawater. A frightening, exhilarating charge permeates the entire atmosphere of the sleep van. An overpowering sense of ambient destiny fate crushing in on all sides. This is accompanied by a nostril flaring, neck prickling vertigo. What provokes this disorientation, says Dr. Peebles, is your body's awareness of its proximity to an enveloping illusion, a dream, not your own, pumping out of a donor's prone form. The unhosted ghosts of these dreams in transit en route to facilities where they will be tested, processed, plated on ice, awaiting transfusion, world blueprints. Mm -hmm. Roberta, according to our monitors, is discharging a shocking quantity of dreams. They go soaking out of her mouth and snaking through the breathing tubes, a galaxy per millisecond. The nurses claim not to notice the smell anymore, a clay odor you can almost taste, which reminds me of the white frogs we used to net from midnight ponds, the scooped and dripping lilies. Minutes four through eight, as the coils begin to heat, the child's fantasy is in the room with us, unexpressed in any consciousness. Her dreams glug out of her. At the end of the draw, the machinery makes a fantastic chortle, a sort of mechanical black, and one nurse, Louisa, who is very uncomfortable with child donation, giggles hysterically and says, pardon me. Two days after my last call to the Harkonnens, my boss, Rudy, and I are alone in the trailer coding for dispatch. At 9.04, the slumber core alert icon flashes onto our screens. Seconds later, Rudy is on the phone with Washington. They want every core employee present for a live broadcast in orientation to some new crisis set to air in an hour's time. They're calling it the worst scandal in the slumber core seven year history. Oh, fuck me, says Rudy, glued to the screen. Get everybody in. And here's what we learn in the hour that follows. On March 23rd, a man who the media is calling Donor Y walked into a sleep bank in San Diego and asked to register. It was his first time donating sleep. According to his file, he's a 42-year-old white male, 5'7", 189 pounds, 128 over 67 blood pressure, no sexual partners, no children. He checked no on all the disqualifying boxes. Sleep apnea, no. Sleepwalking, no. He was next handed the CDC alphabetized list of all 300 known contagious nightmares. Abomination, horned, ambulance, frozen yellow siren, anthill, no queen, ants, flesh eating, aorta, burst, asteroid, green, attic, grandmother's ghost, attic, padlocked toy chest, avalanche, death of self, avalanche, death of spouse, avalanche, live burial, etc., etc. Donor Y did not check a single box. For the past seven years, the CDC has been working in collaboration with every local branch of the slumber court to keep a dream database. They monitor the occurrence of contagious nightmares and detect trends, track and investigate outbreaks of similar dreams in certain regions, nightmare clusters. Donor Y reported clean. 
baby-like fetal position was what he wrote on his questionnaire in response to describe your sleep posture. His handwriting is neat and evenly spaced. The only unusual thing about it is that Donor Y wrote in tiny all capitals, like a scream shrunken down to a whisper. Having passed the pre-screen, he donated a 12 hour unit of sleep. Nothing occurred during the draw to put the nurses on alert. Early estimates suggest that anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 dreamers might have been infected with Donor Y's nightmare. I'll stop there. So that's the, that's the big hinge. Was that more than five minutes? I'm sorry, Jim. <laughs> uh, I wasn't. <sighs> uh, we're, we're 25 minutes into the show. That gives us half an hour more to chat or whenever we That's feel great. that. that yeah. uh, I'm pretty impressed. My daughter's napping late, so I feel like, yeah, uh, thr thrilled to keep going. So it's, it's a gift. She's a wonderful sleeper. She's a... <laughs> um, you know, I, I did. She's our baby. Eh? We, I, I had no children when I wrote this, and I think I secretly dreamed of getting a sleep donation from a baby. That was before I understood that, for the most part, they're really not so great at sleeping. I think I just didn't understand that that cliche "sleep like a baby." Um, yeah, I wonder. Was sort of doing. inaccurate because <laughs> they don't. They, they wake up every two hours, so at least in the beginning, um, yeah, this was a revelation to me. Would work. Lines, right. They sleep about twenty hours a day. There, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. Or, um, yeah, hibernating creatures, maybe. Uh, yeah, only now they're learning that it's more of a torpor. It's not truly. Uh, it's not really sleep. It's not. Really it's more like it's more like dads during the Super Bowl or something, just kind of uh, beached on the couch. Yeah. Sounds something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I I have been. Uh, uh, I've been obsessed with watching uh, uh, Africa. There's a uh, show on YouTube called Wild Earth. Ah. And called Safari Live. And for seven hours a day, they have jeeps going all over Africa and the Maasai Mara and uh, different parts of the Kruger Reserve. And you just see lions and elephants and naturalists talking about it. And uh, this this is addictive stuff. I've been doing I'm... it about five years. <laughs> that seems it. like a really healthy addiction. I remember my sister used to watch, there was like a, a show called Meerkat Mansion. Yeah, Meerkat Mansion. Um... Just finished re-watching it. <laughs> Which was so funny to me. I mean, it's basically like, you know, plotless footage of meerkats, but you can sort of impose, you know, if you want to talk in British voices and like stage your own version of, you know, uh, there a were Bronte two, novel, you, you can try. There were two versions. When it was first on in the U.S., they had Sean Astin and then Stocker Channing were the narrators. But the British <laughs> version, which is currently on Amazon Prime, uh, is narrated by Bill Nighy. Okay. And they, and they absolutely give it a narrative. <laughs> you know, well, which is nothing compared to one that we try, don't know that we'll continue with, called Prairie Dog Manor. <laughs> it's like Fluffles thinks that, that he's got grumps beat. We'll see about that. <laughs> Um, I mean, I really appreciate, you know, the attempt to impose a narrative on the prairie dogs and meerkats because there are other shows on that channel. You know, there's one where it's just like puppies, like tumbling around, like clothes in a dryer. And they're, you know, you know, it's a, less of a shape to it. It's more just adorable creatures like tumbleweeds of puppies kind of coming around. Yeah. So uh, but they but they're, they're, they're aware. They know that they have us hooked, I guess. You know, there, there's a deep need, I think, for that contact. <laughs> Yeah. among our species uh, uh, uh the wild earth show in africa again it's on uh once in the morning once uh at night and it's the opposite of ours of course because it's mostly south africa right they, they are just entering what passes for spring for them and then their summer will begin in about a month <laughs> and uh and the personalities involved. 
are very strange people. Uh, they, <laughs> uh, during the pandemic, because they don't have many tourists at all, in fact, it's a very dangerous thing because it's easy for the poachers to get in and stuff like that. So they've expanded mm -hmm. widely to all over Africa. And when the pandemic is over, I think they will, again, focus on one reserve. And then you really start meeting these men and women who are crazy people. Mm. There's one who writes his own songs and sings them while he's just driving his Jeep down uh, the reserve looking for what's going to be at the next uh, water area. Mm. I highly recommend it. It's uh, it's free, no commercials, all on YouTube. I'll check it out. I was just thinking, you know, I have a, a friend who, this is in Africa, but he was um, hiking through Joshua Tree and uh, he loves the desert. And he was showing me pictures. You know how Disney presents an oasis to you? It's just, you know, it's just lush and beautiful and there are palm trees and just, you know, sparkling water. He was explaining to me why he finds the oasis terrifying. <laughs> you know, yeah. he's like, "Well, you just know that all the creatures—it's a magnet for any number of things." And I was thinking, I, I wish someone read a horror story about the oasis because it is right. It's like this liquid magnet, and you're not really sure who's going to show up at dusk to take a drink. Yeah, um, exactly. Rud Rudyard Kipling had a story set in India, of course, but where during a drought all the animals had to come to a pool mm -hmm. and have a, uh, uh, a truce, a peace pact. Oh, that's beautiful. Forced. And that's one of my favorite stories is Lydia Millet. I don't know if you know her. She's, she's a super genius and she has a story called Girl and Giraffe and it's exactly like that. There's just this long afternoon where a lion, a young lion is permitting this giraffe to drink and it is this wordless somebody's observing this sort of wordless compact and mm -hmm. it's obviously it's it's you know the the line is spring loaded this is this is just a temporary reprieve and it's you know barely intelligible to the humans watching it's a, but I'll, I'll have to find that that kipling story because yeah, that does sound like an uneasy hour <laughs> it's in the uh I think there's two collections of jungle book stories. They're not all Mowgli stories. And this right. is the second one of the two. It's actually a later story, as I recall. So, uh, but, but, but it's good to really read them. I, I did not, uh, I'm, I'm quite done with the, the, all the different animated versions. The VR, right. I know. I saw this technology today that honestly it was Ray Bradbury's The Velt. You know, it was like a, a giant wraparound screen with like a line. I was like, oh God, we're there. It's happening. Is, you know, or there will come soft rains. I mean, we live in those houses now, you know. Yeah. So that's, really. uh, as per our discussion. Oh, good God. Now, a lot of animals find their way into your stories, don't they? Yeah. It's, it's good when an animal visits it's good if you can make an oasis that an animal can drink from in a book i think yeah. well i'm also thinking of the one with the horses that were all presidents oh yes that's right i know i've gotten that question a little bit jim people are like what what you know what's trump going to come back as and i i would never you don't want any no horse should have to host the him quarters <laughs> of uh yeah, I mean, who wants to burden an animal with with uh, that particular consciousness? Not me. Yeah, no, I actually a dung beetle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good candidate. Yeah, um, I, I think so. Ro ro rolling something toward Capitol Hill. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I would, I would, I just would want to spare all the animals that. Um, yeah, that, that would be just a, a very cool. difficult uh, road to hoe, I think. Yeah, um, but yeah, you know, Joy Williams is a writer I really love, and she she always says, you know, an animal should grace a story. Um, 
And I, I do sort of think it's nice in a way. One, one nice thing it does is it opens up the world and you realize humans aren't, you know, especially now in the Anthropocene when everything's on fire, it's nice to remember how we got here and also maybe displace ourselves from the center just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm really excited to read some of my favorite kind of animal narrators with my with my kids uh, in a yeah. couple of years. Yeah, they're just the right age. So they are, and they know. I mean, they understand. They they have so much respect for other sentiences. You know. Are you going they to? Write? What's that? Are you going to write anything for your? Oh, kid? gosh, that's a good question. I think my son already is like a really stern editor at bedtime. He can, you know, he's like that. He'll, he'll tell me like, no, mama, no, they, they're they not in the sky. You know, he's really, <laughs> um, he's better, at, he's better at plot than I am. He, they're always like, the stakes are always, you know, completely apocalyptic. And there's just, a, it's, it's, a, it's closer to sports, you know, there's antagonists and um, the, a lot of high drama. There's none of this sort of like poetic, you know, uh, digression. It's all, mm -hmm. it's all like. Uh, None of the laid back stuff of Mary Poppins. No, like, no. It's like these are kids that are growing up, you know, they're all um yeah, the eschatology. I can't, I'm afraid to pronounce that one out loud. They're yeah, you had it, you had it. I had I see I, I get shy with this new I I'm making uncanny uncanny eye contact with two of my faces for some reason. So I, I psych myself out. But they are, they're like Book of Revelations kids, you know, they're coming, they're going to come of age in a very different, I feel like in the, in the 80s, we were just starting to have this dawning of, you know, a little bit of awareness that we might perhaps be doing irreversible damage to the environment. And all the commercials then were just like, you know, cut your beer can, cut through your six pack and save some dolphins. You know, I think we thought that would really be sufficient. And now it's just a whole new landscape for these poor children. Um, yeah. who have to really reckon with the scale of the damage we've done. And yeah. So, but yeah. I mean, when, you know, when even Disney is doing like Wally, -E, you know, like when Disney is doing the end times, yeah. we're in big trouble. All time films. It yeah. is. At least of this uh, uh, new millennium. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, just a few science fiction films that I think have really been great movies. And Wally. -E, yeah is well it's 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 got a section in the middle where whenever the people are too involved it's oh, yeah. not yeah i totally agree and that feels like it could be excised and nothing would be lost that's like you know yeah totally, that's totally. like a psa to get us all exercising who needs that in the middle yeah, of the movie yeah. just keep the robots but aside from that <laughs> other favorite movies have been her you know i didn't see her but i that's the the Siri love story, right? Yes, yes. Uh, or, 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 yeah. It's closer to Siri than anything else. Yeah. But it's a lot deeper. Yeah. Than in calling it that, because it 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 takes any number of levels. And uh, are you familiar with Alan Watts? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Well, what if I told you that much of what her is about is all based on Alan Watts? Oh. Who, in fact, shows up as a character. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. They don't build it that way. And um, I don't want to give too many plot points away. But uh, yes, there's a lot of satire about our yeah. relationship to that technology. But when you are done with it, there's a lot of deep philosophy in that movie. And, mm. it, and it comes from the writing of Alan Watts. Yeah. Uh, it's, and it's a shame because they don't really push it. Charlie Kaufman wrote this, of course. Right. Wait, was it Kaufman? Maybe not. I don't think it was. I'm going to check because I have, you know, what I just started watching. Um, and it was it was the sci-fi. Uh, it was one of his his um, sci-fi stories. But do you know Nathan Ballingred? I know. I, yes, I know the name. I haven't read him as much as I should. He's sort of a. He's like yeah. Um, I don't know what you North American magical realism or a speculative guy. He's a beautiful mm -hmm. writer, terrifying writer. He has one of the best vampire stories I've ever read, and the saddest. 
but Hulu has done his, they did an anthology series of his book, North American Lake Monsters, and they're calling it Monster Land. Um, and it's so good. I think it's so good. I was nervous because I really love the book. So you never know how the adaptation is going to go. But I think yeah. it's great. No, it's it, it wasn't Charlie Kaufman. It was Spike Jones. That's right. And and that and that's why I got them confused because Spike Jones's first movie was being John Malkovich, which is absolutely that's right. Charlie. Oh Kaufman. yeah, what a classic! That's amazing. So her was one of my favorites. Uh, Arrival. Arrival was great. That movie was great. That was another case where I was like, there's just no way they're going to be able to represent a teleological language. How will they ever do it? Yeah. And they they found a way. They found a way. They, oh. they, made, uh, they made an unfilmable story filmable. And yeah. They really pulled that one off. What of your work do you want to see dramatized? Oh, gosh. Well, you're reminding me now. I saw Arrival in the theaters with my mom when I was uh, pregnant with my son, and I couldn't stop weeping. I mean, it's very moving. The story is incredibly moving, but that, you know, if you're especially in that state, I think, oh, you know, God. it really comes full circle in this, like, gorgeous way. And I, I didn't understand why my mom, I sort of, I, I underestimated her. I was like, so I was trying to explain the ending to her, you know, and she just brushed me away. She's like, yes, yes, yes. Our foreknowledge of death is very painful. Anyway, you know, she's like, yeah, I got it. <laughs> Let's go to the car. You know, she's very matter yeah. of fact. <laughs> but also the, the, uh, somehow they managed to get the language concepts. And yes. I mean, what, a, what did I, that's what I, I was like, they're doomed. There's no way. I mean, so much of the pleasure is deeply cerebral and it, it, it I just love that about the story. You you feel yourself straining in your own mind to adopt this new grammar, you know, and to sort of think think about time in mm -hmm. a way that's sort of unnatural, you know, to our to our species anyway. Yeah. Um, so those yeah, are, I loved it. Yeah. So uh, I think some of your fiction goes into those areas. Some of your fiction is outright comic and satirical. Yeah, it makes me nervous about adaptations. You know, I am, um, a couple things are option right now, but I, it's not my first rodeo. I feel like I've had, I've had quite a few things optioned and then you, you just never, you know, you never, I have my hope, I, you can't, hope can be excruciating, said a friend of mine. <laughs> Uh, but I hope I hope on, nevertheless. You know, I, I would love if somebody would do sleep donation. I think that could be so cool in the right hands. You know, it would have to be someone who could really manage the tone. Because I do think, like you said, there's some comedy in it, you know, like a, like a pretty dark comedy. But it, it couldn't be like straight horror, you know. It, you um, no, you wouldn't want it to be. Because there's something sort of, and I, I'm, you know, but there are, there are directors who, who can do that. I feel like um, there are, there um, are, um, there's uh, some uh, one. Well, take Charles Yu for example, who has mm -hmm. somehow worked his way into working uh, with Noah Hawley on Legion, and yeah. uh, I haven't seen Westworld, but he was the story editor for the first uh, season. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Jim, you know who I think is amazing to this point? Have you seen Alex Garland's stuff? I hope I'm getting his name right. Yeah, yeah. I, he did I, Ex Machina. Yeah, I saw Ex Machina. I don't know if I'm rushing to see his uh, Jeff Vandermeer. Uh, the Annihilation? Uh, yeah. Because... I you didn't I, like Ex Machina. Oh no. Oh, I loved Ex Machina. I loved that movie. I loved I, it too. I, I thought it was quite brilliant. Yeah, uh, me too. My problem is Annihilation, where, where and I have read the whole trilogy because mm -hmm. I understand that it's rather gruesome at parts. And I am not good with gruise. I I get queasy. I yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I would have to start doing sleep donations. I <laughs> well, you'd have to be careful not to take one from Jeff Vandermeer or Alex Garland, then you would just be in the same boat, you know. 
I am. I loved that movie too. And the ending is pretty bad shit. I'm going to say it really is a wild ending, but I, I was just so excited. Um, oh, I loved it. The book doesn't really end in the same way. It's the first book of a trilogy. Right. But somehow right. I think that the movie makers that Alex Garland and I'm sure Natalie Portman uh, had a hand in it as well because she's a bit of an auteur. Yeah. Uh, knew that it wasn't going to be a franchise. Right. And had- I mean, in terms of just like a, an uncanny transformation, you really can't ask for more than what they do at the end. I, I understand why some it might be a bridge too far for some viewers, and it is really gory. And Oscar, is that his name? Oscar Isaacs? He's an amazing actor, but some of the CGI kind of distracted me a little bit, or it kind of breaks the spell ever so slightly. Mm-hmm. I mean, I could have, I think less might have been more on some of the effects, but, you know, I forgave everything because I just thought the ending was pretty stunning and really unlike it. Like, it's it's amazing that he pushes into this place. I don't want to give anything away. I might. Um, my, my, yeah, that was another one where I was watching it with my parents who I was like, oh God, they're going to just, you know, this is going to be way too much for them. And my dad, you know, who was like falling asleep as per our conversation about hibernation and torpor, you know, he was, he's like a 79 year old. He's wonderful, very smart guy. He's just falling asleep on the couch and like through his one half lidded eye, he was like, oh dear, looks like that one's dead. Well, at least she gets to be a rose bush. <laughs> so I'll try to yeah. you sort of uh, evaded the question. Why do you want to see adapted? Oh. Oh, gosh. I mean, the the honest answer is sort of anything. You would like to do. I would love if some, if the right person could figure out a way to adapt Orange World, which was that demon story I told you about, because Mm -hmm. I really think there's so many great movies about parenthood out there, but I have not seen anything that gets into this particular neighborhood it, I, I think if someone could tell the right kind of love and horror story mm-hmm. um and hit some of those comic notes and i you know i'm not you know i i bet a, I, there are things i think a movie could do more successfully even than a story you know it'd be this is a pretty short story you could have like a bigger canvas and you could maybe have um you know and you know how there are just so many pocket universes even within 10 blocks of your house so one of the things this book has like a kind of a new mother's group And I was just so struck. I really did lean on some of these veteran moms myself, you know, Mm -hmm. and you just see that there's some universal dimension to this, you know, the bringing this object dependent onto the planet, you know, it's very audacious thing to do. And then also everybody's experience is so particular and it's inflected by their, you know, race or ethnicity and culture and income level and all these other variables. Um, So I just think if there was a way to use the through line of this scaly demon rat that's just promising all these women that their kids will be protected if they nurse it. That could be a fun through line. That's my, that's, so that is, that, that would be my dream uh, okay, of an adaptation. That, that could be a streaming series if you think about it. A demon is like a fun, <laughs> yeah. a fun way to stitch a lot of lives together. I mean, I really do think that that is something that is sort of the low, you know, it's a it's a common denominator for our species. Everybody would would do anything, you know, to protect your little one. And there's something beautiful about that. Um, I think we, you know, we, we kind of fetishize it in this culture. And then there's like, there's obviously a dark side to being willing to do anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so, yeah, you should have your... Uh agents look for the right team for that yeah. and then and we can get walk on roles as you know the demon in season four or whatever i feel like right. but you <laughs> the, know the longer this pandemic goes on the, the more ready i am to audition for that role myself right. but you know people who know people like charles you at this point is totally in the industry yeah, that is very cool. Yeah, he's he's adapting Interior Chinatown for Hulu. That, oh, that's, that's so cool. And that's he, really exciting. Uh, he's done an amazing amount of work. I I didn't realize any of it until I was watching Legion, and just saw his name on the screen. I'm going, whoa! So he's working with Noah Hawley, who's not exactly your average director. Uh, uh, if you're not familiar 
with his work aside from Legion. Um, he's been doing the various TV series based on Fargo. Oh, I didn't know that. That's who Noah Hawley is. Uh, I've got to find the name of this. Forgive me, but this is this is a movie that I feel like nobody's heard of, and it is so good. It's like a doppelganger movie, and mm -hmm. they seem to be everywhere right now. Um, it was like, do you? I, it has a name like Convergence, but I don't think that's the name. And it was like a dinner party. Um, everybody shows up and their cell phones are cracked. Something has cracked the screen of their cell phones and references made to this sort of like astronomical event. Um, that's like, you know, the last time it happened was in the 1800s and everybody went mad and there were all these reports. So it starts off as sort of like, you're just really positioned on this seesaw of etiquette and panic. You know, the power is gone. No mm -hmm. one's sure exactly how dire things are in the outer world. Um, they send like kind of somebody out to sort of report and the person who comes back is in um, difficult, you know, unpinpointable, but frightening ways a little bit different than the friend that left the house. It's really fun. I'm gonna have to do some sleuthing because no one has heard of this movie and it's, it is just excellent. Um, I, would, I would love to hear the name of that. So uh, when when uh when my husband wanders up here, I'm gonna ask him. I think it sounds like convergence, but it's not. And it's like a little chamber drama. Um uh, Room and Alarm. I don't know if you know him. He's I I just got his book and haven't read it yet, but it's sort of the same setup. Later, I'll put it up on the screen. Okay. Yeah, and you know, while we're you know, later on now. <laughs> put text on the screen after the fact not yeah. on the radio version of this yeah. yeah i will say i do still think since we've been talking about film there are things i think that books continue to do better than film you know i having just said that i think there are things a film could explore that a short story can't just right. the drama of consciousness i mean i just there's um in terms of like exchanging dreams between bodies i still feel like a book is the superior technology oh well, I, oh I think that's a storyline. I think I had somebody else's dream early. I took a nap earlier, and uh, or it was one mm -hmm. today actually. And I had somebody else's dream, like it was about a seventeen-year-old girl or something. Uh, I see aspects of my real life, in so far as when I was that age, I was living in Queens. It used that neighborhood, but. Uh, I uh, the family was packing everything up. We went over to another house and I realized I was never going to see the place I was in anymore. And ultimately I realized uh, in the dream that I had died. Oh no. To this other place. I was living in this wonderful house and moving to an apartment. <laughs> and all that. And actually, I grew up in an apartment. So it was somebody else's dream. Wow, I love that. I totally, I mean, why wouldn't that be possible, right? I mean, have you, I used to routinely, you know, calls would get scrambled, right? Or, you know, you get different radio signals, you know? Maybe yeah. you were just an antenna for that girl's dream. You don't know. So this is an idea that I've had for years and years, but mm -hmm. I can't write. That's a, that, that's from my partner, Barbara Krasnoff. Um, my, uh, but I've always had this title and premise, Other People's Dreams. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, that's in a different way. I mean, it's sort of, um, you know, there's like a whole medical infrastructure around it in this book, but that's sort of what's happening. You know, people are dreaming one another's dreams. Right. Um, and, and hopefully you're like a good match with your dream donor. And, you know, now there's this whole kind of centralized um sleep banking system that's going to spin nightmares out of dreams um and then and, you know then like the nation's sleep supply gets tainted um mm -hmm. and i mean that's sort of i mean I, when i when you think about the way we're wired together right now or just we've all wired ourselves to the great lidless mind of the internet um and it's just a very porous time um i love that uh that story that nathan ballingrid story that's so scary it's a boy who's like 
his his real life sucks. It's very difficult. His mom is sick. He has to drop out of school to take care of her. And he becomes increasingly active in these online boards. And he just has a low immunity for what is essentially like a nightmare um, that he catches, you know, from the computer. I mean, it's not it's not a literal nightmare, but he just, you know, he's really absorbed into this underworld. Um, and it literalizes something, you know, or it's just sort of, it's like a distortion that lets you see. Okay. I may have it here. Uh, his novella was the visible filth and the movie was called wounds. Is that correct? I'm thinking of one called, this is the new, uh, anthology series, Monsterland. Oh, okay. But that sounds great too. Let me ask me, Tony. Well, I've heard of Monster. What's the chamber drama that we really liked with the doppelgangers? Oh, uh, it's called Convergence. It's not, or is it? I thought it was called that too. The one with the like meteor. Yeah. Okay, I've got a sleuth. He's gonna he's gonna find the okay and we'll the amazing it. doppelganger movie. I'm, I'm <laughs> And I'll tell this to the end. I think actually you're being told by. Uh... Is it maybe it's called Coherence? Coherence, Coherence yeah. is the name ah, of this movie. Very good, Coherence. It's great. And do you remember who directed it? That I can look up. It was directed by, yeah, strange things begin to happen when a group of friends gather for a dinner party on an evening when a comet is passing overhead. And it sounds a little bit, oh, it's a, a director I've never heard of, James Ward Burkett. That's my recommendation to, to your okay. listeners. I think it's I great. Will ab- I will absolutely <laughs> look out for that. And, uh, and, 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 but I suggest people don't uh, look it up in Wikipedia or anything as I just did because it already had a spoiler. Oh come on! Well, I'm sick and so fr- I know that makes there's that's a very specific kind of frustration. Yeah, a lot of times book reviews will give away, you know, I, I mean movie trailers too. You sort of oh, absolutely feel absolutely. betrayed. Yeah, oh, uh, and if something is released in another country before it comes mm-hmm. here, it's like today is uh, Wednesday, and. Mm-hmm. The Great British Bake Off was on in England yesterday. It'll be on Netflix on Friday. Avoid any of the articles that mention the Bake Off. <laughs> they will. They will say, "Isn't it terrible?" <laughs> that person did that. And wonderful. That person did this, and it's like, yeah. No, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> I am. Um, yeah, that's a special. That's sort of a, a futuristic, you know, way that we live, just in the present, where you can sort of choose, you know, what corner of time you want to occupy, and can keep your blinders on. Um, it would probably not be twenty twenty. I, yeah. I, I I don't think I would want to redo twenty twenty. Yeah. Um, is there a way this year is going to find its way, either fiction or nonfiction, in your work? I think so. You know, I was part of this. Um, the New York Times Magazine did this this issue called the Decameron Project, yes, where we were all tasked to write very tiny stories, and it was a it was a challenge for me because usually my sh- my short stories are incredibly long. They're and they just keep getting longer. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. Um, but this was just a shorty and it, it was about a metaphysical accident on a bridge. And I think that was uh, one of the challenges of writing about something that's ongoing is you don't really have perspective, right? And time feels like especially dysfunctional to me right now in this way. And and um, I think I'm very in touch with both the hope of this time. On the one hand, it really does feel like there's been, you know, we were talking about like this these amazing outpouring of cries for justice, racial justice, climate justice, you know, people really demanding serious, profound change. And that is exciting, you know? And then I also have a very cynical side, you know, it's, it's just, you, you want to believe that we won't all um, become amnesiacs again on 
when when things are reopened and we can walk around, we can, you know, yeah. I mean, it, unmasked. It, 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 so it's hard. I hope that we can keep this momentum and these cries for change. And it's like our track record is very bad as a species. It's very bad. So yeah, it is. Uh, Especially when it comes to things like uh, racial justice or social justice, mm -hmm. uh, people have to be reminded when there's been something egregious now right. or only remembering the the Spanish uh, influenza a right. uh, hundred years ago, or the immigration act that prevented Chinese or anybody else from coming into the U.S. Um, right. around World War II, and uh, my parents, who were both immigrants, found their way in by literally making deals with the government. And, and it, it takes something like this where we're all kind of scalded awake together, but it's, it's um, I think it's hard to imagine, you know, it's, it's the long game, right? So you hope that people um, can sustain this sort of commitment. Um, I don't know. I've been reading a lot of pandemic fiction, so I haven't been uh, writing really so much about this time, but I just finished Severance, which I thought was amazing. And mm -hmm. Carmen Maria Machado has that great pandemic story. Yes. Um, yes. I, I, I haven't read it, but I have like a desire to read The Day of the Triffids again. It seems apropos. Yes, it does. Although I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but yeah, it absolutely is. And there was a good TV production of that as well. A I love that book so much. Yeah. Yeah, John Wyndham in general, but I I've been playing avoidance basically. I've been. Yeah, uh, I respect that, Jim. <laughs> in, in complete and utter fantasy, and uh, thinking I'm glad I got Disney Plus. <laughs> Sometimes I mean I yeah there was a stretch for me too where I love horror movies and I just had to I had to you know go go on hiatus for a while because I just. There's yeah. only so much cortisol your body can really produce. <laughs> yeah. you know? Absolutely. I, I, I won't go beyond uh, the fearless vampire killers. That's, that's horror enough for me. Yeah. I was on earlier this year on a big Paul Tremblay kick, who I love. He's sort of a new discovery. I'm sorry. Who? He has this Paul Tremblay. Oh yeah. I mean, he's new, he's new to me. Everybody else has known about him for a long time. But I, I read Growing Things, and I was like, oh my god, that's yeah. something I would love to see adapted. I, that that collection is just um, terrifying. I, I, terrifying. I, I may get there. I've actually, um, well, he's an East Coaster, so I see him at ReaderCon and various conventions. When yeah. they used to actually be in person. <laughs> to get back there. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could all just be at an open bar together again and shadow casting reality? I hope it happens. Soon. Yeah, that's the thing that I really miss. I, the, the online conventions yeah. are a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed them. But having the bar afterward, <laughs> having the, the... Yeah, you get to congregate. Because it, it feels so abrupt after you finish these things to just then you're blasted back into your life. They have chat channels, but it's just not the same. I just no. feel doing Capclave, and they had something called Discord. So it's sort of like Slack. And yeah. it, it, you know, it just isn't the same for me. I've got email, but I miss having been in touch with you. Yeah, same. I'm going to go, you know, I've always wanted to get to ReaderCon and it's just never worked out. But now I see if I have the opportunity, I have to seize it because you don't know what's coming around the corner. And yeah. maybe we're all in our gas masks again. So you you just better take advantage when you can. You and ReaderCon were made for each other. Um, you should get in touch with Rose Fox. Oh, yeah. You know, I've been in touch with Ellen Datlow a little bit, who I love. She yeah. um She's such a terrific editor. I've been reading, you know, the stories. Speaking of good horror, have you read this one called The Night Cyclist by Stephen Graham Jones? No, I, I, I know of him. Oh, my God. It is terrifying. And Ellen's I feel for any all the animals that wander into his stories. I feel for them. It's it's a dangerous place to. Mm. Uh, if you're if you're a dog, if you're an elk, gotta be I'll, careful. 
I'll ask her about that. She, I, I, I've been friends with her for many, many years. But oh. uh, I, I, I mentioned Rose Fox because she handles programming at ReaderCon. Okay. So All she's right. just the That's big. Put my deal. name in the hat. Yeah. Week, which she is, uh, but she's also the big deal at ReaderCon. So, uh, if needs be, I'll send an email to connect the two of you up. All right. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, that does. I, that is something that I'm, you know, um, large groups of people in a lobby of a hotel. Um, that just seems like a nostalgic fantasy to me right now. No, or even so. better in the suite where, where people are uh, serving vittles yeah. of various kind. Yeah. It is, it is a very interesting, I mean, I wonder how quickly these new norms will get rolled back. I suspect probably faster than we think, you know, because the other way we just kind of, that's so, we're so habituated to be together that. Um, yeah, I, just, I mean, I think it'll happen faster than we think. I just hope that it's going to be safe. Me too. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's already happening. That's a very good point. I mean, there are parts of the country where they, they, it, it never stopped happening. <laughs> and you see that. A few miles from here. On yeah. Monday, there was going to be a wedding of a particular sect of Orthodox Jews, the Hasid, called the Satmar, where they had invited, are you ready, 10,000 people to the wedding. Oh, my God. That's my horror story. Who wants to plan a party for 10,000? That's what a nightmare. Well, they don't plan it. They just go and they dance and they sing and various things and it took the governor to shut it down oh. oh i mean of the tragedies of this year that is i do feel you know i had a couple friends who had weddings planned and really so much goes into that and i realized that's sort of low on the list during a global pandemic but you you feel for everybody you know that had yeah. some milestone coming it is um it, it has been it has been a difficult stretch and i think books have been a real lifeline for me because it's a lonely time and you know, books, I'm yeah. sure you're the same. Those are our friends. Yeah, <laughs> you you get are. to spend time with your, your friends, your far, you know, living in the dead ones, you know, all of them uh, on your shelves. So that's, that's a, a real consolation. So yeah. having said that, what are you working on now? Gosh, I feel like that you feel we're you all in this. I mean, I feel very lucky to be able to be home with my kids, but I'm, I've got my one-year-old and my three-year-old. So I, I mostly work on keeping them alive and it's not as easy as you'd think. They're, they're very mobile. My, my daughter's always on like a treasure hunt for fatally small objects. You know, my son, that table behind me, he's, you saw him, Spider-Man. He's very, um, very uh, agile. Um, yeah. He also has like he, his, and, and I admire this, but like his understanding of physics is not fully developed. Like the law is natural law and consequence. You know, I think it makes sense to him. He, if you think about it, between like two and three, all of these other things have happened. Like he went from crawling to walking and speaking. He also can narrate his dreams to me. I mean, there have been these huge leaps. So he probably does think that Spider Man is the next, the, the logical progression. You know, he's like, yeah. well, I'll probably be flying tomorrow. Like, look how this this is a real steady. Uh, we're just moving exponentially from <laughs> tadpole oh, to hero. I had to ask you, I should have done it earlier, a specific question about sleep donation. Oh, okay. Arcanin? Yeah, thank you. That's a little bit of just a wink. I wish I had like a more, I think I disappointed my friend Kevin Brockmeyer who wanted, he was like, is it just the flat echo of the name? Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, no, I mean, I, in the, I, I wanted to wink at that book you know, Harkin and they're obviously the villains and this family, it's like a blue collar family um, that's being exploited by their, their babies being mined by this organization. So they're not, you yeah. know, they're, they're not the antagonists here. But I just thought, you know, that book was so important to me. And you'll remember they have that um, initiative to try to synthesize spice. Um, yes. So in this book, there are these, these, you know, brothers, maybe modeled on the Koch brothers a little bit. Um, oh, well, one can tell just from the name, you know, and they're um they're behind this new nonprofit um, that this this woman is sort of suspicious might have ulterior motives. Um, as we should all be suspicious of all big tech uh, all the time. I think um, more suspicious than we are. Um, 
I've, I've but, but the Harkonnen, so yeah, so, so synthesizing spice. You know, this is another book where it's like monopolistic guilds have formed. And, you know, there's this, it's, I think that book is so prescient. So some of the conditions from Dune, I really see in our world today. And, and, and they exist in this near future world of sleep donation too. Um, and, and so it's a little bit of a, a wink to what I saw as a kind of a through line, you know, or kind of a way that you could read. Um, the, the some correspondences, who, as different as these books are. Morris is the one who wrote, and or at least is the director of the new version of Doom. I'm I'm excited yeah. to see this movie. I hope I hope. I'm it's yeah. Good. I'm hopeful because I think he's a great director. Um, but I also thought that the bizarre David Lynch version had a lot of good things about it. I'm a huge defender of the Lynch version. Oh, so really? you and I can, yeah. And I remember how cool those still suits looked. I mean, yeah. he had the right imagination to take that project on. And I know it's 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 controversial to be a, a fan of that movie. I feel like a lot of people aren't, but I also yeah. loved it. I am the one thing that is difficult to take and this drives Barbara crazy, is the depiction of, of the Baron uh, Harkonnen in the yeah. uh, But I also understand why Lynch did it. Because yeah, it's, sure. The only thing in the book that makes Harkonnen evil is that he's gay. So Lynch had to take that somewhere else. Is that the only thing that I have, you know? Well, it's really the only... He's kind of an egomaniacal. I mean, he just is a, you know, so I feel an, like... So to an extent is Duke Leto. Yeah. You know, the, the, and all those people, uh, and certainly the emperor, none of those people are particularly nice. But that was the main thing about Harkonnen was his lust for his nephew. Of course, they Lynch helped by that by making the nephew sting. <laughs> and oh, yet, gosh. Okay, who wouldn't have had lust for sting in those days? Well, that's probably so. I should go. You know, now I feel like, am I wrong to defend this movie? I'm going to have to go back and rewatch because you can't really. No, 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 no it's worth you, it, it, yeah. it, um, it helps to remember that Lynch did cut a two hour and 40 minute cut from his seven hour long script. <laughs> and then the producers took something like 20, 25 minutes out of Lynch's version. Mm. And that cast is so wonderful from Jose Ferrer to Patrick Stewart to. Um, uh, Linda Hunt and Francesca Annis, fabulous cast. Yeah, and he did. So I remember. I mean, I I will confess, I haven't seen it in a really long time, and I you know I just remember thinking it was so fever bright and totally wild and trippy in the right way. It was. But I don't I don't remember too too much about depictions it, of it got the Baron, partly because well Lynch is Lynch. Yeah, I had a friend speaking of sleep who rode next to him. She just happened to get bumped up to first class and she got to sit next to him on a plane. And she said they never said a word to one another. He slept like a baby for this entire like six hour oh, that's flight. Awesome. There's something I don't know that was so beautiful to me. <laughs> he, 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 yeah, yeah, uh, but imagine his sleep donations. Well, that's what I was gonna say. You figure that air out like the recycled air. I mean, that's like sort of prime real estate. Uh, uh, <laughs> Also, like that does that seems I have a nostalgic fantasy for remember when you could sleep on a plane with like 300 other adults? Yeah, That's, you know, and that and that was just routine. We all we all could do that. Any night flight, any red eye that you took it was just yeah. uh um I'm working, I should have I didn't I evaded that question too. I'm working on a novel that I've been working on, it feels like for all the years of my life, off and on. So I'm trying again. This feels like my my seven hundredth attempt to summit Everest or something, but I took a little, I was working on stories for a while and now I've brushed that dusty thing off and I'm I'm trying again. So. Yeah, but you're also so lucky with all those wonderful stories, finding them in what other people would call mainstream publications. 
Yeah, I do think that's very lucky. Very unlikely. (laughs) Yorkshire, you've been in. But weird, you know, uh, I've been in LCRW too, a conjunction. So I feel like I also feel very lucky to have found a home in some places with uh, some of our weird friends, you know? Yeah, but some of them, they never get to climb out of that ghetto. I wish we didn't think of it as a ghetto. You know, I I think it's starting to change a little bit too. It is. I hope it is, right? I think that, you know, people like, I was thinking about Ursula Le Guin who lived in Portland and and, um, we were so sad at her passing, but the doors and doors and doors that she's open, you know, the way that she's, when you think about her beautiful career and how prolific she was and how no one can read an Urs- a book from Ursula without understanding that this is some of our greatest literature. You know? Yeah, and uh, N.K. Jemison, Nora Jemison. N.K. Jemison, yeah, sure. Right nearby. N.K. Uh, Jemison. Is uh, a new shining star. Yeah, so, definitely. Uh, and what what was it she tweeted not long ago? She doesn't have a book out that hasn't been optioned. A lot Very of exciting in development. While you understand op- why too, because it's such a um, those are such fully imagined worlds, and yeah, I think like it, and they're so visual. You know, they, they you see that they would lend themselves to just be inhabited. And she's a world builder. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's a good way to describe her. You. On the other hand, our dream builder. Oh, thanks, Jim. I hope that's true. I, I will. Works for me. <laughs> our uh, 55 minutes is now 76. Oh, no. Yeah. But hey, it'll be great online. It just won't be the radio show. But this is the first video version of the radio show ever. Very cool. Well, I am honored to be the first virtual guest. Uh, and I hope that we don't go that long without speaking again. I hope no, that, you know, we get on a more regular I'm rhythm. To, I'm going to ask you to email me. I don't have, unless it's the same one you had about nine years ago, your email address and or phone number. Well, I, I can absolutely supply you that. Maybe I won't do it on the live show, but <laughs> email to me. And I and I don't mind saying I am Jim at our wolf, H O U R W O L F dot com. All right. And in fact, one second. Uh, I will just uh, share it for everybody. I do not mind. It's been on the air often enough. There we go. All right. right on the well, thank you so much for having me, Jim. It was just thank a blast. You. Thanks for the great right. recommendations. Yeah. I mean, you had to move to the West Coast, but you had to move to the West Coast. I, I did have to move. But now we can defy time and space and, and talk like this on the regular. So okay, hopefully cool. I'll... I'll Talk to you again soon. Yes, and and you're going to do another uh, reading at the reading series. Right? Yes, yeah, it's good. Oh, it's good that will keep me in time. Maybe we'll be celebrating a very different reality in March. Let's hope. So. I certainly hope so. Yeah. All right. Well, big love to you and Barbara. Great to talk to you. Thank Bye. you, Jim. Thanks, guys, for tuning Bye. in. All right. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye.